So you've heard from uh, creator of WordPress and Drupal, and you just heard from Jay Money about how to make smart websites. Yeah, right? He, he, I don't know. I thought that some of that stuff was pretty money. So, so Jay Money taught us some of that. This is not going to seem directly related to that, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about two open source platforms for controlling graphics and controlling hardware. And it doesn't seem like it's maybe related to web stuff, and it's not directly, but what I think uh, I'll be able to show you over the course of this talk is that you can use both of these things to augment things you're doing online and also do creative projects. So uh, just by a show of hands, how many people here are coders? Cool. How many people here are strictly marketing? Okay. And how many people are just hobbyists and like tinkering with stuff? Yeah, cool. All right. So my goal is that I know your time is valuable and I will uh, have little tidbits uh, I think I put in this presentation that will address all those things. So crossing an Arduino is really just a shortcut for you know, there are platforms that are just about graphics and hardware. And so I'll talk about processing first. And what processing is, is it is a language that has been um, created through an open source community, it has lots of contributions, a very active user base. And what it allows you to do is easily manipulate graphics, create animations, and also do cool interactions with uh, users. So they can you know, over the internet, or if you have an application written on your laptop and you're at a conference, they can interact with it and change the displays in, with only actually a few lines of code. They've boiled it down so that it's just the bare bone stuff. And what I'm going to show you is in less than five minutes, we'll get something up and running. It's really interesting and stunning, but you don't even have to write a single line of code. And then as we progress through the talk, I'll give more advanced examples. So I think people who are interested in marketing, you'll see some ideas on how you can tie that in because this is, both of these platforms are really all about prototyping quickly and efficiently. It's about you coming up with an idea, like I'd really like to show a video of um, this particular thing that my company does and then maybe do some cool graphics with it. Or I want to show a photo and do something with that. Can you hear me? Cool. Okay, so let me give you this first example. So this is all But these are, this is obviously on the more advanced uh, end of the spectrum, but these are very interesting graphic manipulations you can do with fairly simple commands. And this person has, has put this together, so it's a large project. But this, uh, I, I tried to explain what processing was to my girlfriend, and she gave me the blank stare of death. So I thought this would be a much more easy way to show you what you can do. Yeah. Interacting with touch screens and producing results quite easily. I don't like that music track, so I'm just going to talk over it. Um, so that's one way, that's really how processing can uh, allow you to do cool art projects and hobby type stuff without knowing too much about what's going on. Um, this is obviously the more advanced side. So then, um, for those of you who are in web marketing, I'm a scientist and I'm really interested in uh, how you can visualize data in effective ways. We do, uh, I work at David Eagleman's lab at Baylor College of Medicine and we're about studying human perception. So we put you in an fMRI machine and we scan your brain while we show you particular stimuli, and then we see what's lighting up and you know, what's correlating, and how is it that that three-pound thing in your head is constructing whole reality. Um, so you know, we divide the brain into 50,000 small little pieces, and we see how one piece is talking to another one. As you can imagine, that's a really highly dimensional space. How you can effectively visualize stuff is really important. What processing is able to do is with um, its open source uh, Software, there's a lot of toolboxes that you can quickly use to effectively show the kinds of data that you have um, and are interested in displaying. This example right here, I think, is directly related. It's all about uh, web marketing and how you can track links and how users follow them and then what the effect is. It's called Cascade. And there's not volume now. Some mention just the headline and the link, but many offer a short explanation or opinion on the article. This whole thing is written in processing. To investigate this data further, we developed a tool we call Project Cascade to visualize sharing activity. This tool illustrates the connections between readers and publishers and helps identify... So what they're doing is they're taking, uh, you know, they're basically doing a 3D map of how people follow links. So this is over time, 16 hours after someone's clicked and posted a link, what happens? There are Twitter feeds out there, um, and how does that... Uh, you know, it's something that's difficult to understand given how many things are going on. So what processing helps you do is um, 
to visualize that. And so this is, again, more on the advanced side, but I just want to give you guys a quick introduction on what's possible if you spend some time with this software. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a couple quick examples. I said within five minutes we'll get something up and running, so let's do that. Processing here. Okay, so one of the, this is what the IDE, uh, the IDE looks like. Uh, you go to processing.org and you can download it. It works. Awesome. Okay, well, let me just do the shortcut because I'm sick of dealing with this. See that? Cool. Hopefully this works on two screens then. Okay, so this is what processing looks like. You can download it. Uh, I think you guys are on Facebook or something, so I didn't want to rely on actually showing you that. Um, you can open up um, a sketch by going to the file menu that you can't see and look for examples. That's really a problem. Hold on, let me see if I can solve that. I guess that's better. Well, let's see if that works. Okay, so anyways, you're looking at processing. You can go to file, and um, a quick side note is all the programs that you write are called sketches, which is really to show you that what this is about is sketching up ideas. It's about thinking something, oh, I really want to see generally this kind of visualization. How quickly can I just mock it up? And if I really like what's going on, you can hire someone to do it more professionally. Or sometimes, as I'll show you later, it's good enough. So you can look at all these examples that are built in, right? There's ways to mess with the camera. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the live feed from the camera and uh, run a thresholding algorithm on it that this entire piece of software is built in. I didn't write a single line of this code. So let's see if this works. Cool. So it basically turns uh, me into a black and white image in real time. And when I f you can um, mess with the thresholds and, and do various manipulations. It's a really easy way to it is a really easy way to start learning how to code if you don't. You can look in here and kind of look what's going on. Maybe you see something called threshold. And I decide I want to change that and make it higher. So it'll change the output. Let's it go. It's a very forgiving language. So now the threshold for turning things white uh, is changed. So you can get a different output. And so you can customize that. Immediately, when I saw this, um, my friend introduced this to me. And I thought, that is something I really want. I'm a drummer, and I perform live with DJs. And what Half of the performances is about making great music, and we play a lot of clubs. But also what's lacking from a lot of performances that I wanted to incorporate was how do you make really cool audiovisual stuff. And this hit the spot. There's six or seven built-in algorithms for taking video. And so uh, I amalgamated them all into one program and then added some code of my own and got the following. Cool. So this is uh, just taking the raw video and displaying it. And then uh, you can write an algorithm. This one is called frame differencing. And what it does is it just takes the difference between one frame and the next frame. And this example is also in processing. Just you can copy, cut it, paste it. And so if there's no change going on, you don't see anything. But if you move around, then you can just see what the difference is. So as you can imagine, when you're performing live and moving around on the drums or the DJ scratching, that's a really cool effect that you can add in without, again, without really doing much at all. So uh, I think there's a couple other ones on here. You can do cool artwork. This one, this one was included in, it, in processing as well, where it takes uh, each pixel, it takes an average value, and then rotates it randomly. You can do monochromatic things where it takes, you know, depending on how bright something is, it'll change um, the output and the size of these squares. Do anyone have a question? No. OK. Yeah, if you guys have questions, feel free to just ask as we're going along. I mean, uh, we're going to go through one example in just a couple minutes where we'll start kind of from scratch with an idea that we had and see if we can build up something. So that's another example. That's actually, um, you can't see it because the monitor size is kind of funny. But again, uh, if you want to do some marketing with that, you can have an application, put that on there. The visuals attract people's attention. And then I have my logo when it works in the bottom right. Uh, and so you can, again, people are really drawn to that. It's really effective. People, <laughs> people always ask me afterwards, oh, where can I buy that software? It's really cool. And I, I want to take credit for it, but I say, you know, I, uh, this is mostly open source with a couple modifications. Uh, and it took me about 20 minutes, you know, maybe with some code changes. So that is a quick example of doing uh, absolutely no changes and getting cool result. Now I'll show you uh, one quick example where we can look at a program. We'll just change out one file and 
for, uh, and it'll take the same effect and just mod modify it slightly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this thing called explode. Again, this is, you can find it in processing. You just hit file, example, uh, and it's in there. And this will take just an image. This is an image of my neuroscience lab. And as you move the cursor across, it'll explode outward in a cool visual effect. So immediately when I saw this, I thought, you know, if you have an idea and you want to, I really want to see what something looks like with a quick explosion with this picture with our logo at the end of a movie or whatever, boom. You can go without writing any code. All you do is sub in the name of your image that you want that it loads, and it'll do the same quick algorithm on it. So I thought that was really cool and really easy to do without knowing too much at all. Now I want to get into a couple more advanced examples. What's this? You can also take video feeds um, from stuff you've recorded. Um, this one, if you want, you can quickly take some video on your iPhone, sub it in, and that you can run some algorithms on. This one's called Pixelate, and it takes a video stream and it just chops it up into this screen size is so small. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, well, this is the image of a train going by, and this is a quick algorithm that chops it up into tiny little blocks and then presents it back to you. So you can do that with anything. There's a bunch of, um, if you explore a bunch of examples on this. And what I found amazing about processing is um, some of the things that I wanted to do that weren't immediately in the example program, you can do a quick search online and figure out a way that somebody's already done to modify or, again, to uh, just make some quick changes to things that have already been done. So uh, in the neuroscience lab, we are interested in how uh, people receive reality. And there's this one illusion called the herring illusion. And while we find uh, illusions to be interesting is because they're really great examples of when your brain is perceiving reality, but it's, it's clearly doing it in a way that, that isn't consistent with what you is actually out there in the real world. So this is called the herring illusion. And by a show of hands, uh, how many people see this part as bent? How many see the two lines as straight? OK. Cool. Well, the, uh, they're actually straight in real life, but your brain perceives them as bowed outward, kind of looking more like an oval. And so we're interested in why, why is that? It's such a striking difference from what's actually drawn on there. So there's a couple uh, theories on this, and one of them is based on the idea that you're constantly living in the past. So uh, when light hits your retina, it's got to go you know, through your optic nerve, and then go through your LGN, and then go to the back of your brain, which is where your visual response is. And by that time, it's about 100 milliseconds later. So you're living 100 milliseconds in the past. All the visual information that you see doesn't get processed until about that much later, about a tenth of a second. Might not seem like a lot, but you can imagine if you're playing baseball or you know, you're hitting a 95 mile an hour fastball or playing football or you know, running from a cheetah in the African plains, then that's going to be an issue. So you're going to be off by several feet if it's a baseball, and you might get eaten if it's a cheetah or hit a tree. So what we think your brain does is it extrapolates forward about 100 milliseconds, projecting what it thinks you're going to see in the next scene. And so what this illusion would suggest is, if you see all the radially expanding lines out there, that's uh, what we think is a signal of optic flow, which is when you're moving forward through the world, and everything is kind of streaking by you. So that's what the radial lines represent. So we, what we want to do, if that is the case, uh, in the next scene, you'd have these parallel bars in front of you, and you need to move. If you move forward, they look a little bit bowed out like they do in the herring illusion. So we got curious. Maybe we can replace these static radial lines with an actual optic flow pattern. So, you know, stars, like a star field, like the crappy screensaver from like Windows 95. So if you get that, do you see the same illusion? And I mean, I thought, we just need to mock up a quick graphical thing. This is great for processing. So let me exit this presentation. You go to processing.org, and I thought, maybe someone has already built some kind of star field. So this is what the website looks like. What did I search? Star field. Right. There it is. Somebody's already built all the code for a star field. So what I want to do is, now we have this idea, let's copy this, all this code. And unlike, you know, uh, almost everything on computers, the code just seems to work the first time. It's cross-platform. It works in Mac. 
uh, Linux and Windows. And so unlike PowerPoint, when you move it from one computer to the other and like your images are all jumbled or something uh, and doesn't work, usually you're processing, there it is. So that's great. So you can hop online and do any kind of search for something you're interested in. And there's usually some kind of open source code out there. So this is the code I end up using, which is just a star field going by to represent optic flow. And now all we want to do is we want to add a couple lines on there. Uh, like I want to represent those herring uh, bars again, those parallel uh, bars. So what I want to do is then, you can see it, it basically executes this command over and over again. It's called draw. And so every time, draw a black background and then draw a bunch of stars. That's all it's doing over and over and over again. So what I want to do is there's a command. I love this. Hardware hacking. We're going to use this as my mic stand. I'm up here. Okay. There's a cool reference manual, but uh, just a simple function. It's called rect. And you draw, you know, where I want it. I want it at 100, 100. And I want it to be like 20 pixels wide and, I don't know, 200 pixels long. Let's see what that looks like. We take... We took what was just working, and we can add a simple thing. Okay, getting there. So the background's changing a little bit. So let's, there's also a command called fill, and these are all easily, uh, like I said, available on the front page of Processing website. Now let's see what we got going. Cool. There's one line, and you can imagine that, you know, at about 15 minutes later, I can easily mock up a prototype of exactly what I want to present to subjects. Maybe move this bar over a little bit. Pretty close. So I have a moving star field, which is what we wanted to represent optic flow, like you're moving through the world. And then we wanted to see, you know, if we put these parallel bars in front, do we see the herring illusion still? I don't see it on this one. But let me go to the website version. Code it up. Let's see. And um, processing is run with Java. So if any, uh, there it's very easy to look at across web. Okay. Well, the display is not going to work right. But you have to take my word for it. You can kind of see the bars coming up. That there you have a star field that's flowing, and then we have two bars popping up, and we we were able to use this, and this is exactly what we use for our study. So in my lab, we just wrote a paper where we presented subjects with the stimuli, expanding uh, and contracting motion, put some bars up there. We found a positive result. Uh, we ran the whole thing in processing, logged all the data took me you know, maybe a couple hours to, to do everything, and then we are going to submit to Nature Neuroscience this week. So it doesn't always necessarily have to be that it's just for mocking up project. You can always end up using it um, as your final version in some cases. Yeah, and the crappiness of my placement of those bars. But yes, it's, it's probably the width of it. Uh, you can see in the, in the original illusion they're pretty thin. I just wanted to, see, to show you that you can start with an idea, look online, amazing open source community with lots of contributions. Grab something, make a couple quick modifications using some basic functions like, can I draw a rectangle? Yes. Can I change the color? Yes. Can I make them flash? Uh-huh. Pretty easy. So that is essentially um, what you can, uh, just one example of how I've used processing. I'll give you another example at the end. I actually use it to control uh, the drum set that I'll show you guys. But that's kind of the end of what I want to talk about for processing. Are there any questions specifically related to that? Uh, well, if you're a scientist, you'd use it to run an experiment. But if, uh, like I said, it's, this is for, uh, I think visualizing data is an amazing example of how you can use this. It's really, really fast and good. Like that star field, it does it in a way that a lot of languages can't do easily. It creates a bunch of actual like, objects and it's able to make them go through time at uh, you know, a frame rate of 60 hertz, which is pretty quick. And if I tried to do the same thing in MATLAB or another um, language, it would take me a long time to get that to work properly. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> the tread no, the treadmill one? I mean, it's, it's impossible to know uh, without seeing it what language it was written in. Um, 
really anything you can think of that you want to quickly mock up graphically is able you're able to do in processing. Like I said, that kind of that first example I showed is more on the advanced end, where you're taking user input, messing around with it, and having all these complex interactions come out of it without too much else on your end. Um, but I could I mean it could be Final Cut, it could be Adobe Premiere, I don't know. Huh? Oh, cool. Interesting. I think you could probably mock that up pretty, I mean, that's exactly a great example of what you would want processing for. I have this idea, let me see if I can mock something up. And instead of drawing a rectangle, maybe you have an image that looks like a person and you can just quickly tile it up there in the shape of whatever ASCII text um, you entered. There, uh, well, if we want, we can talk about it afterwards, but there's, I think, that exact program. And not in the shapes of people, but you put in text and it'll do cool manipulations based on um, what you put in. Anything else on processing? Great. That's great. I actually glossed over that. I was going to show you at the end, but uh, so it's extremely easy. It just, I'm, ex I'm amazed with this program because it just works. Like you copy code off the internet and it works. And I switch it from my PC to my Mac and it works. And when I want to export something, you can, let's export our crappy herring illusion. Uh, sure. Okay. So it'll write it to, let's see, we'll save it as a sketch. Uh, we can make it for whatever platform we want. Let's make it for Mac. Cool. So then it should just a quick application executable. So now it works uh, with full screen. And so you, the export options are to, I don't know what the extension is on that. Um, on Windows, I think it's an EXE. And on Mac OS, what is that? APP. It's just an app. Or you can... We could take our application and we say export and we get it ready for the net and then it exports all the files you need. Uh, I don't have my FileZilla but I just uploaded it to my server and that's where I got the herring illusion that was slow, uh, but online. And it just, you just copy and paste it up there and it works based on Java. You see the Java and Java files. I don't know. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Cool. I'm going to transition then and go into something uh, slightly different, which will look very similar, I think, to lots of you, but it's called Arduino. And this is an Arduino. Arduino is hardware uh, for controlling other hardware in, in an easy way. So you have basically a bunch of input pins and output pins, and, that's, and then the ability to do processing on whatever your inputs and outputs are. And that's really all a circuit is. It's, do I want to read data off a sensor? That's your input read it, oh, if it's really high, then do something, or do I want to turn on an LED or turn on a toaster? I mean, that's what I, when I <laughs> first learned what this was, I was like, what are you going to turn on a toaster? Uh, and I actually wanted to show you guys that, but there's some guy who made a, a website where you can go to his website and vote on what kind of toast he should have, uh, you know, how crispy you want it, and then uh, the next morning it'll turn on his toaster and cook it for him based on uh, input. So, so, that's gonna, so I'm going to start with the least useful for society things, uh, and then I'm going to build up for, and hopefully end with something that is an example of how um, really the way that Arduino and processing has lowered the, the barriers to entry for everyone to, to do projects that they think are cool either for art or for social good. And the consequence of that is that you really you get some amazing and easy um, applications and examples of, of social good happening with like a $40 Arduino board. I think it's 30 now. But uh, so I'll start with the toaster example, example which is really, you know, the worst one. And then uh, we'll move up. So here's the herring illusion. We just saw that. Okay, so here's another example, uh, slightly more useful. If the, you can see right here, this is actually an Arduino board uh, that's attached to some PVC. Can we turn the lights off? I'll hack in the dark. Okay, well, um, and what he has is he has attached to his door uh, deadbolt. So now we have it firmly uh, attached to our door. Um, and the power is on. And our door is locked. If somebody comes by and gives a wriggle or not, nothing happens. But if they come by and give the secret knock, the door is unlocked. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so this is just a simple uh, way of taking Arduino and absolute. taking input from something that's called a piezoelectric uh, device, which just transmits um, force into an electric signal. You read it on here, and then you write a little piece of code, and he posts all this online. You can make one of these uh, tomorrow if you want, uh, after the at end of ShippleCon. And, uh, and then it, takes, it puts an output pin and says, hey, turn this motor on, and it turns in and unlocks your door. I mean, it's, it's simple. And it's really easy to mock up, and the code's already there. And like a lot of Arduino projects, the entire steps on how to make something like this are easily available online. Um, but what I want to do is I'll present some examples of increasingly, uh, you know, maybe some more importance. But hopefully it'll inspire you to come up with, oh, I never thought that, you know, it was a project I had in the back of my head. I never know how I would go about to approach building it. Uh, and hopefully this will inspire you to say you can either do it with Arduino or processing or some other um, open source language. So. That's one example of uh, Arduino. Um, I know some of you guys are into robots or RC helicopters. This is a <laughs> this is a um, a self balancing robot. It's like a little Segway, so it cruises around. There's a video for it, but I don't, we don't have time for it. Um, and if it starts to sense that it's tipping one direction, there's a little accelerometer on there, and it'll just move it more in that direction. So it actually is quite effective at staying upright, which I think is really cool. Um, and what else do we have? Oh, I don't want to show you that one yet. Okay, so now uh, they have given you a couple quick examples on what we can do. I want to close this, and I want to start doing some hacking. Oh, go away. Cool. The screen thing is miserable. All right, we're done with processing, and we need to look for what Arduino sketch we're going to do. Oh, let's use this one first. Okay, so this is uh, built in with, you notice it doesn't look much different than processing. So again, you can go to file, look for examples. There's a whole uh, host of things from just turning the Arduino to make an LED blink or sending MIDI stuff, um, uh, getting data from sensors. There's NOC is actually, there's all the code from that NOC sensor that I showed you that opens the deadbolts. Um, and there's a whole host of examples. This one is how to, uh, you can actually load audio files onto your Arduino and play it. So if you want to make a custom door knock or something, then you can go ahead and do that. All you need is your Arduino, which is here. Can you guys hear me like this? I might just do that. I don't think I can uh, fiddle with this hardware and we turn the lights back on. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, all you need is a USB. Light on, you got a power light that shows something's working. Uh, and then you go to sketch, uh, sorry, tools, and you want to know there's all sorts of different types of boards. You can have some of them have built in Wi Fi cards. So you can, uh, actually, use that to make a wireless drum. Uh, and then uh, there's a lily pad, which you can put on your clothing. And you can sew it right on. A wire like Daft Punk style. Stuff, that's pretty cool. We just want to make sure it's on the seal report. Yep, okay, so we opened up our sketch, upload, uploading the board, you can see a bunch of lights going off. Cool, done uploading. So now, now that the sketch is on here, it's actually running this thing over and over again. Let's see what the pinouts look like. 8 ohm speaker on digital pin 8. Okay. For our little 8th in stereo jack, we can plug it into. One and eight. They're all labeled. It's like in. Okay. I'm going to use my speaker. Back in order to plug in this. Back. And here's my. 
Might have to be quiet so we can hear. Now I'm going to restart my RC show because we're going to hear. Awesome. So, so you can make really advanced melodies really quickly, uh, which is helpful. So, I mean, you, maybe you think that's useful for a door knocker, but um, that's just built in. You can now take this and modify and say, oh, you know, if you look down at the sketch, what, what's going on here? Okay, they're playing a C4, a G3, a G3. Maybe you have a song that you've crafted that you can use. Um, I can't think of anything else besides a door knocker. I don't know. When someone walks in your room that this goes off and this is a song, cool. Then you can use this note. That, that's how people can turn the note. Let's go. Um, that's one quick example. So that's using Arduino as a stereo. Done with that one. Um, so this actually didn't use a sensor. This was just using, uh, as soon as the sketch starts, wait, I don't know, two seconds, and then play this melody. And don't play it again. So if you want to do a sensor, um, they're great. I, the piezoelectric that I showed you with the, with the knocking, how that works. Knock, and if you text that there's a knock going on, the sensor goes off. That's what I use for my drums, and that's what all electronic drums do. Electric tap it, you're doing it. So either when knocking, you're definitely doing it off, or um, I'll show you an example later. Where, yeah, a great example in a couple of slides where you actually use a laser and it makes it depends on what kind of sensor you use. But the timing on this thing is accurate. To all it's doing is running the same algorithm that you use. Occupied with the same thing. Okay, cool. So um, now I want to show you one other quick example, which is operating LEDs. I love LEDs. So all we're going to do is we're going to, this sketch is called Blink. Again, this is right on the Arduino. Um, all it's going to do is turn the LED on for a second and then turn it off. LEDs. Round. 12 volts. Uh, the other thing that's cool about Arduino is it works on transistor transistor logic, which is typically 5 volts, but you can plug in. Now, now I got 12 volts. So this sketch says turn pin 13 on and off. So why don't I upload this to the screen? Yes. Great question. Yes, it does. Cool. So uh, you can see one second. It's going to turn on. Sketch lead. I happen to have it plugged in the computer. Cool. Connections that we saw before that it is basically turn this pin on and off to turn it on. So now we have an LED. Take this and expand upon it and make a whole bunch of pins out of it. A set of colors or a whole set of LEDs. And since I am a uh, so how do you start from a current slide? Yes. That one? Great. Oh, it's so awesome. So just using Arduino and the pinouts, you can just say, turn this LED on at this time, turn this one off, turn this one on, turn this one off, and you can make uh, what he has, I don't know, 50 LEDs, uh, probably 100. And you can just index them and, and do whatever, whatever comes to your mind. So if you wanted, he did this for a Halloween costume. I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty groovy. Um, OK, so this is maybe something I actually didn't expect. I was looking around for cool Arduino projects that I would show you guys that you might find applicable just across a whole wide variety of things. Um, what this is, is this is using 
the Arduino and using a laser that whenever something breaks this threshold, I want to trigger the flash on my camera, take a photo. So this is how you can do really, really precise timing uh, and slow motion capture. So he's actually popping a balloon in that top one. I, I don't know, I've never seen that before. And the bottom one I, I is probably milk dropping or something like that. But it's uh, quite simple to do. You just say, you know, read input off this laser, read it, read it, read it. I'll actually show you the schematic. It's, you know, with a lot of open source stuff, you're typically dealing with um, not the best schematics, but you have an Arduino. You got one pin. You wouldn't even need to know how electronics really work to get this to operate. Like this, it's really that simple. You got a laser. Whenever you break it and the photoresistor doesn't, isn't getting the signal from the laser, trigger the camera. So that's pretty cool. I thought that was an interesting application I hadn't seen before. Okay, one more example before I get to some more advanced stuff that's built in um, is this MIDI thing where you essentially are cr turning your Arduino into a MIDI device where it's sending out MIDI notes. So we'll let me upload this really quick to our Arduino. And what's going to happen is it's going to play a scale. It's going to play a whole bunch of MIDI notes going up and a whole bunch of MIDI notes going down. And if you want to connect it to your computer, you can get a cable for, I think it's about 10 bucks. Done uploading? Great. Give me a sec. So all that's going on here is you want to have the serial pin on your Arduino. And you one side, wherever it is. And you have three pins. You want power, ground, and whatever your MIDI. Five volts. Ground, we need ground. Lastly, what does it say? What pin is that? Okay, pin five. Now, hopefully we're getting a MIDI signal. Let's see. It's working. So we're going to start GarageBand, and hopefully we'll hear a scale of piano notes coming from the Arduino. <laughs> okay, let me restart this. Nope. Hold on. I'm determined that every example. Yeah! Cool. So you just turned your Arduino into a, a MIDI device. It's now sending MIDI notes and it's triggering a piano sound. You can map it to whatever you want. Smoky clav. Whatever you want. Okay, that's enough. Okay, so uh, there's actually a cool example of someone online who made a, a laser harp. This is like one of the cooler Arduino projects where he has a bunch of lasers coming up and you tap any of them and it triggers a MIDI note. So that's actually what I've done with my drum set is I'm using Arduino as a drum brain for this whole thing where when you tap any of these drums, send a little voltage signal to the Arduino, read it. If it's higher than a certain level, that was a hit. Let's send a MIDI note equal to that. So I will show you that in a second, but um, first I want to get to the, the one really cool um, social good thing I think that's going on with this is this is a, I think he's 13, uh, he's in Chile, and after they had some bad earthquakes, he, uh, as you can see in the bottom left, he simply hooked up his home earthquake detector to an Arduino, and whenever it got above a certain level, detecting a seismic quake, it would, uh, over this LAN, there's Arduinos that come with LAN ports, interface with his computer, get on the Twitter API, and send out his tweets. So everyone would have an instant notice, and he's able to, I think he's detected every single earthquake since May. And this is, you know, a little $30 piece of software, and this is exactly what I'm talking about, where when you lower the bar on accessing these powerful and quickly, you know, sketchable um, ideas, you can get these interesting ideas that, you know, most people don't think of. You have this wide distribution of brains on the planet, and the best way to get the most good is to let everyone be as creative as they can. Okay, and, you know, I think I'm going to skip, maybe I'll skip the drum thing, but what I do want to talk about is uh, something, a current project that my lab is working on, and this is how um, can you get senses into people who have, who have lost them. So if you're blind and you've lost sight, or maybe you're congenitally blind and you never had it, how can we take visual information and feed that in through another mechanism. So uh, 
Uh, this is called sensory substitution. And one example, we've already written an app for this, is you take your iPhone and you can um, cruise around the room and then we run a bunch of visual information algorithms on it to see if you can detect lines that are there or anything that's able to help someone navigate. So you might say like, and you're feeding it in through auditory channels. So it's like taking visual information, transmitting it. And what the brain is really good at is wrapping itself around whatever kind of data you, you send it. I mean, it's totally random that we happen to have eyeballs that take electromagnetic radiation or that you have eardrums that take air compression waves. I mean, we could be a lobster and have magnetic senses, but we don't, and that's just how it is. So the question is, in the future, not only can we substitute senses, but can we add different senses? So we have um, some projects in the lab where we take visual information and you feed it haptically through your um, body and see if, you can, you, if, you, if that's meaningful, if you can translate that into something. So I came up with the idea of using uh, an Arduino to do this project where I'm going to take, let me show you. No. Hacking and computers are not working. OK. What I have on the top of this right here is called a ping, and it is a ultrasonic sensor. And it, so it's admitting pulses above the frequency at which you're able to hear, 40,000 hertz. And then it receives the bounce back, and it says, how long did that take? If it took a long time, then the object's far away. And as you get um, to closer objects, it's much more immediate. So you can tell distance. You're basically doing echolocation. The question is, can I take this and feed it to someone as any kind of other information, whether it's uh, auditory, or in this case, we're going to use touch, and can that help people navigate? So let me mock up this. I mocked up a quick sketch. There's, uh, I googled um, the ping controller, and there was, of course, an immediately an Arduino hit for um, controlling this thing and calculating distance, which is right here. And I added a couple lines of code to then translate that uh, right here uh, into uh, output for this motor pin. So let me wire this up. Give me another 20 seconds, and we'll uh, and I'll show you this device. Okay. So again, all we need to do plug in our Arduino into our into our computer. I actually wrote this sketch on a PC, so it's never been uploaded on a Mac. It's on my Dropbox, but I have. Full faith that Arduino will handle it. Hopefully. Yes. Okay. Right. So now all we have to do is wire up this simple piece of hardware. We need five volts. That's here. And we got ground. That's over here. And then we need one pin. What does it say on here? OK, we need digital pin 7 hooked up to the signal line. Pin 7. OK. Yep, so that's working. So now it's sending these ultrasonic pulses, and it's feeding the information to Arduino. Now what we want to do is we want to, so that's our input. Now I brought a cheap little motor, this, uh, and I'm going to map this to two seconds, I want to map this to uh, just the output. So I'm sending everything to pin, ping pin, seven, I think it's three. Yeah, okay, great. So I think it should be working right now. Cool, yeah, okay, great, it's working. So let me do the mic so you can, so you can set. So, so there's nothing in front of me, so you don't hear anything from this motor, and as I start to put it towards objects. See it start to go, you know, close you get to an object, you get further away, you got nothing going on. And as you get closer again, so, uh, and as you move your hand in front of it, it obviously goes nuts. So what this allows you to, to show is that this is something that we've now started to test on blind people, and it is helping them in navigating the world. So we had someone come in yesterday and they, kind of walked around with it and just were able to detect walls. I mean, it's pretty obvious when there's a wall in front of you if you have a sensor to detect, detect it. And you can do it at longer ranges than canes. And also, we, you know, we want to get rid of this, you know, that maybe there's a stigma there. And so if you can have someone walk around and feel a little bit more normal, not have to use a cane and sense things at far, farther distances, that's awesome. And you're able to mock this up with three wires and like a $30 sensor. So I hope I've been able to convince you guys that 
Arduino and processing are super easy to use. There's lots of examples out there, and what they're able to do is let people fully embrace the creativity and do good things with that creativity or just think of Thanks. I think we only have like very uh, two minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, what, like how hard you hit it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, if you want to stay around afterwards, I'll show it, but I just, there's so many cool examples I want to show. I mean, in 20 minutes, we made a stereo, a MIDI controller, uh, an uh, LED controller, a haptic uh, little object, and then if we had a couple more minutes, I'd make it into a drum brain. I think that's, you know, for a little $30 piece of hardware, that's extremely flexible. Really easy. I mean, uh, let me, let's go through, we can, in the last couple minutes, I'll just show you a couple. Uh, okay, all you, I mean, this is just so you can communicate with it. You don't even really need this. Okay, so all I'm doing is, um, let's see, this is probably not the best. I'll use my drum controller. Okay, all I'm doing is every time uh, I go through this loop called loop, and I just say, what time is it? Okay, did I send any commands to it? Because I, what I want to do is, when I'm basically uh, interfacing, processing, and Arduino together in this cool little nexus where you can, I can press keys on my um, laptop and it turns on lights on and off on my drum set or change modes from flashing to on or whatever. So it's checking there, but uh, some of the most basic stuff is, okay, um, where's the hit detection? Okay, cool. So check what's going on. Here's my velocity. It's, did I get a MIDI note and, is, and, uh, and what's the velocity of it? Okay, now if there was a hit, then change the color on all the uh, LED pins. And what you do is either something called analog write, and you just write, you know, is this on or off, and how on or off is it. Just kind of turn it on a little bit, and you can do fades with it, or something called digital write, and you just, that's like the flash thing, like turn that pin on, trigger the flash. Turn that pin off, um, turn that pin on again, trigger another flash. So it's, it's pretty simple. The commands are just write this value to this pin. I think that was probably overly complicated. Uh, I wish I had a simpler sketch up. But. Yeah, what's up? It is a very close analog of Java. The, the IDE is almost identical to processing. It, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. If you go to processing.org, it's like references, and it just it lists every command and everything you can do with it. it yeah, most, like, literally 90% of what I showed you was already included, and I just did a qu couple quick modifications. <laughs> and I, I just want to reiterate that if you have been timid about coding for whatever reason, this is the... You can't break it. This is the easiest way to start. Start a processing script and say, what else do you want to do to it? I want to add a circle. Okay, circle at these coordinates and see if it works. That's how you learn. You break stuff little by little if you already have it working, and then you, and you can mentally grasp, okay, what does that mean? And you can pick it up. I mean, it took me a week. I think that's the last question. Unless there's anyone who's really... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know what? Um, you are all free to go, but uh, I'll hook up my, let me just download the sketch, and if you want to stay, then um, let me upload it right now, and I'll show you the drums. They're awesome. This is what I want my, I mean, this is what I'm pursuing in my future, and I'm using both these open source platforms to, pro, to pro, you know, propel me out there. Not a lot of musicians do coding, so there's this interesting dynamic of I'm using processing to present cool visuals that are, you know, I can mess with, and, and edit, and do whatever I want in the mode, and then make my own electronic drum set with a cheap little LED uh, or Arduino controller for 50 bucks. 